Well, this next song started out with an airplane ride. It was going to be 39,000 feet, maybe seven miles high, but Gene Clark thought it should be eight miles high because the Beatles had a song called Eight Days a Week. So I said, well, we could change it to eight miles high. Who's going to care? Poetic license, right? Well, I didn't realize it, but the radio stations did the math. They said, wait a minute. Commercial airliners don't fly at eight miles high. They must be talking about some other kind of high, man. Over the years, it's evolved. It's got a little bit of John Coltrane, some Ravi Shankar, and some Andre Segovia thrown in just for fun. thrilled to welcome Roger McGuinn to Nights with Alice Cooper. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. So we want to delve into your history, but there is so much current going on with you that we'll start with that. First of all, tell us what kind of show you have planned for your ethical culture date here in New York, which is uh, the 27th. I do kind of a one-man show. We tell stories and set up the songs with stories, and it varies from venue to venue or from, from uh, city to city. And it's uh, people are asked after the show what they like the best, and they usually say the stories, and then they go, oh, I, I like the music too. So I, I'm curious, uh, you played for us here, Eight Miles High. 
when you play a song like that, that certainly you've played thousands of times, how do you keep it fresh and interesting for yourself? It's always fresh and interesting because I'm trying to get it right. But then when you have perfection, then what? I uh, haven't, haven't achieved that yet. <laughs> All right. So I'm curious, uh, Alice Cooper, his band moved to L.A. in about 68, which is, uh, I believe, when you were kicking around there. Yeah. Do you remember running into you know, Frank Zappa's mothers, the Laurel Canyon crowd. What kind of stories do you have about the kind of freakier side where you were on the more folky rock side? Well, I remember working with Alice. I think they opened up for, the, I guess it was the Birds at that point, and uh, that, that was cool. Um, I don't remember seeing him in Laurel Canyon, uh, or, or Zappa for that matter. I, I knew Cass Elliott, and I, I knew John and Michelle from the village, and... Um, other people in the in the canyon. I, I didn't go to Joni Mitchell's house. I didn't. Uh, I was a little late for that whole uh, Graham Nash, Joni Mitchell, two cats in the yard thing. Um, I was married with kids at that point, so I didn't really hang out as much as the other guys. Um, but I did, did hang out on the strip. I, I used to go to the stores, uh, clothing stores, and stuff on the strip. And then when we got the birds together, we all had place in the canyon. Uh, Crosby was over, I think, in uh, not Benedict Ken, but one of them. And Chris had a house up on. I think Woodrow Wilson, or one of the streets up there. Um, I lived in Wonderland and um, uh, Yucca Trail, all kinds of different rentals, you know, rental houses. And I loved the canyon. It was a great breeding ground for, for culture and music. And yeah. I, did, I didn't really go shopping at the country store. Um, I think there was a restaurant around that, in that building or on the back or somewhere around there. I used to go to that once in a while, I think. But most of the time I'd spend it on the strip or down in uh, probably the Troubadour, the Ash Grove, and uh, hang out at the folk clubs. So uh, do you spend any time there, like say in the last decade, and see how it's changed? Yeah, I've been up through the canyon. It's still there. It's still the same. It's not culturally the same. It's all gentrified now. It's a different different setup. But um, it's, it's kind of fun to drive through from the valley to Hollywood and over the canyon. Yeah, and of course, uh, the Alice Cooper group, I can't imagine with the, the outfits, you know, they were probably in women's clothes, given them to by Pamela DeBar and the GTOs, and you guys were in your, well, not quite nudie suits, but, you know. No, I, I think um, at that stage, we were just pretty much wearing T-shirts and jeans on stage. It wasn't, you know, anything fancy. Although I did dress, I used to wear a tie and a suit, yeah. There, there were times when I'd dress up with a suit and tie, like the Beatles, you know, that was the, the idea, sort of a mod look. Yeah, I think it's interesting that you are, you know, a contemporary of the Beatles, but I, I, understandably you had heard the excitement on this side of the pond. You know, the Beatles are going to be coming here in, you know, the 64, I believe it was. 63. Did, 63. I was, I was living in the village at the Earl Hotel on the corner of Waverly and McDougal, and John Phillips and Michelle were living downstairs. They had a suite on the, at the Earl, and we used to hang out. And I discovered the Beatles, and I, I showed it to John, and he said, ah, that's bubblegum. That's kid stuff, you know. He didn't like he didn't like it at all, but later they kind of came around to the to the rock and roll. Alice Cooper's radio show is classic rock, which encompasses a lot of things. But we play a ton of Tom Petty, uh -huh. and you know we were as shocked as anyone when you know he passed away in such an untimely manner. So I was just wondering if you could share some, you know, reminiscences about uh, meeting him, working with him. Any thoughts about? his legacy, what you think it will be, what he might want it to be? I first met Tom in, in 76, and it was um, I was getting ready to do an album called Thunderbird for Columbia and had most of the songs ready to go, but I needed some outside material to fill it in. And my manager played me American Girl, and I loved it. I went, wow. you know. And so I said, I want to meet this guy. And I met Tom the next day, and we got to know each other, and I invited him to come on the road. I was playing the bottom line, and so the, uh, Tom and the Heartbreakers opened up at the bottom line, and We've been we've been friends ever since, and uh, I'd see him when I was in L.A. and um, I'd see him. I I didn't see him for a number of years, and then he was playing down in Tampa, Florida, and my wife and I went there, and it was a sports arena, and people were throwing frisbees, and one sailed down and hit her in the eye. It wasn't serious, but we thought somebody ought to look at it. So there was a doctor backstage, so we went backstage, and just as we were going backstage, Tom and the Heartbreakers were getting off the bus, and so they saw us in the hall, and they said, hey, Roger McGuinn, you gotta come up on stage and do some songs. And I was wearing white shorts and a red Hawaiian shirt. Looked like I was going to a Jimmy Buffett concert. But I got up and did it anyway, 
And the next day, Tom invited us out to his hotel where his kids were quite young. His daughters were quite young, and we were flying kites out there. And he said, you know, I'm going to be on the road with Dylan in Europe a couple of weeks. I said, oh, man, you're going to have so much fun because I was telling him about the Rolling Thunder tour and how great that was. And he said, well, I'll ask Bob if he can come along. I said, okay. So the next day, he said, yeah, I talked to Bob. He said, bring him along. He can be the opening act. Well, the way it was structured was Tom and the Heartbreakers were the house band. So they backed me up on some bird stuff. They did their set, and then they backed up Bob. And at the end of the tour, we ended up at Wembley Arena in London, and George Harrison joined us at the end for Knocking on Heaven's Door. It was so cool. Well, Tom and I wrote a song on that tour called King of the Hill, and Tom accompanied me on it, and you know he sang on it. And we did a video with Julian Temple for it, and it was great. And I used to hang out at Tom's house, you know. And in fact, I stayed at Tom's house a couple of times. And uh, I'd, I'd show up and go over there, and George Harrison would be over there with his ukulele. And we, we uh, at one point, Tom was learning card tricks. <laughs> he was showing people cards. I, I knew a few card tricks, too. I showed him some back, you know. But we, we had a great time together. And we spent a lot of time together. Is there anything unreleased that you guys did together? Not that I can think of, no. Not unless somebody recorded some stuff from the Temples and Flames tour, but I don't know. All right, beautiful. Well, thank you for, for being here and being on Nights with Alice Cooper. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me.